It's the world's number one interview show, the new global home of big debates and big questions. This is really unfair. Why? We'll explain why. For all the big names. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. You're going, to, you're going to resign? Yeah, of course, I cannot continue my work. Did you feel Elvis was a controlling influence on you? And the good news? You've already found it. All new Piers Morgan Uncensored, right here, Monday to Thursday, 8 p.m. And good afternoon, I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course on your smart speaker. Coming up today, Rishi Sunak faces another testing week as the Rwanda bill returns to Parliament. As the Tory party plots to tear itself to shreds once again, a new poll has shown they're about to be wiped out. Great Britain being run by Keir Starmer is on the way. Full details coming next. Also, the Prime Minister will update MPs on the UK's decision to carry out military attacks in Yemen last week. Stand by for a dramatic session in the Commons. And has Gary Lineker now gone too far for sharing a tweet calling for Israel to be banned from international football? We'll debate the usually impartial Match of the Day presenter later in the programme. And of course, it's your call. This show is all about your responses and your opinions. After a damaging poll for the Conservative Party, we're asking this question. Who will you be voting for at the next election? The lines are now open, 0344 499 1000. Text 87222 or on the socials, it's at Talk TV. But first, let's get the latest news headlines with Bhavani. Good afternoon. In the last hour, there have been reports of a new ship attack on a ship off the coast of Yemen. The UK's maritime trade operations body says it's investigating reports of an American commercial ship being hit from above by a missile. It comes as the chief negotiator for Yemen's Houthis warned that attacks on Israeli ships in the Red Sea would continue after the UK and the US launched strikes in Yemen aimed at putting an end to dozens of attacks on cargo ships since November. The Prime Minister will be addressing MPs later to defend the airstrikes but says he is still Still working towards a de-escalation. Well, our aim is to de-escalate tensions in the region and actually restore stability back to the area. Uh, we faced an escalating series of attacks from the Houthis on commercial shipping, including uh, an attack on a uh, Royal Navy warship. That's unacceptable. It's right that we took proportionate targeted action against military targets. Meanwhile, the Defence Secretary has announced one of the biggest NATO military drills since the Cold War, designed to prepare troops for an invasion by Russian forces. Grant Shapps wants to send 20,000 Army, Navy and RAF personnel to the exercise in a bid to provide vital reassurance against the menace of Vladimir Putin. At an address at Lancaster House, Mr Shapps set out his vision for how the UK will rebuff potential threats as allies remain concerned over the danger posed by the Kremlin. After all, our great resource has always been the men and women who work tirelessly to protect our nation. But to defend our nation from the increasing dangers of tomorrow, they must have what they need to do the job. And that's why this Conservative government has always and has already taken vital steps to increase defence spending. Next, a damning report says that girls in Rochdale have been left at the mercy of paedophile grooming gangs for years due to the inadequate response of the police and council. Operation Span, which was commissioned by Greater Manchester Police, has identified 96 Asian men who are still deemed to be a potential risk to children. It says they preyed on mainly white girls from poor backgrounds, with as many as 111 cases being identified to the authorities. Former Detective Maggie Oliver said the authorities have failed the victims. The failures that happened then are still happening now. We have more communication for sure, but we do not have a system that supports victims, that listens to their voices. And when they do challenge the system, unfortunately, the organisation closes ranks. 
Rail union ASLEF has announced train drivers will stage a series of fresh strikes and an overtime ban from the end of the month in a long-running pay dispute. The action between Tuesday 30th January and Monday the 5th of February will affect different operators each day. The union says it's had no talks with Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary, since 2022. A volcano has erupted in southwest Iceland for the second time in less than a month, causing lava to spill onto the town of Grindavik, setting several houses on fire. There are fears about the town's future, despite volcanic activity appearing to slow overnight, with less lava flowing this afternoon. Iceland's president has said the country faces a daunting period as it battles tremendous forces of nature in the town. And there are warnings today that drivers could face being stranded as an Arctic blast of snow and ice arrives in the UK. The Met Office has issue issued a yellow weather warning until Thursday with over 65s and those with health conditions advised to take extra care. That's the latest. Now time for a closer look at today's weather with Nasnin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, lots of sunshine out there this afternoon, but it is feeling bitterly cold due to northerly winds bringing through an Arctic blast of air. So temperatures are below average for the time of year and feeling colder than they suggest because of the wind chill. And there's also plenty of snow showers about, particularly affecting central northern parts of Scotland where there's a warning for snow and ice and Northern Ireland. There's also the risk of ice for parts of Norfolk uh, later on today and windward coasts of uh, eastern England as well as uh, parts of the east of Scotland and western areas of England and Wales are likely to see some snow showers but most of the accumulations today will be across those central northern parts of Scotland where up to around five centimetres is likely. Then overnight a widespread sharp frost developing once again with an area of rain also pushing into parts of the northwest. Now as it meets with the cold air there's likely to be some significant snowfall. Across Ireland probably just rain and sleet but northern Ireland and southern parts of Scotland likely to see quite a bit of snow particularly for southern Scotland through tomorrow there could be as much as 20 centimetres across the high ground, up to around 15 centimetres towards low levels. It will be another bitterly cold day, but mainly dry for inland areas. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. And good afternoon, hope you're well. Now, when you think of electoral landslides in recent history, you would no doubt cite Margaret Thatcher, 1983, Tony Blair, 1997. These were seismic shifts in our political appetites, reflecting a national desire for change. Well, we're about to see the whole thing all over again. The most detailed opinion poll in over half a decade shows a total wipeout for Rishi Sunak's Conservatives. According to the latest YouGov poll, the Tories will be left with just 169 seats and Labour will come into power with 385. This gives Keir Starmer a 120-seat majority. That is huge. It'll make Boris Johnson look like an amateur. Now, it should be said that landslides happen for various reasons. And in this case, I think we're on pretty safe territory to suggest this has nothing to do with the brilliance of the Labour leader, mainly because he is anything but, well, brilliant. Starmer is not Blair, he's certainly not Thatcher, but his curious strength is he's also not Rishi Sunak. Just by dint of being anyone but the Tories, Labour will romp home with a majority as big as anything we've seen for almost three decades. Now, it should be said at this stage that the Reform Party whilst not predicted themselves to win any seats, will split the Tory vote, they could be responsible for nearly 100 of those Tory losses. And all those red wall seats that were Conservatives, they hoovered them up at the 2019 election, will revert back to their Labour roots. The brutal and irredeemable reality is that the Conservatives are about to be consigned to the political dustbin for the next decade or more. And it's all of their own making. 
For the last five years, the Tories have fought like ferrets in the proverbial sack. We've had more Conservative leaders than we've had hosts of this morning. Most of them have been mediocrity personified. They've lost their direction, the political compass has broken, and their core ideology abandoned. They've allowed the NHS to go to ruin, they presided over a dying economy, and they couldn't sort out immigration if they swallowed the Hungarian government's last manifesto. In short, they've lost the plot. And on top of all of that, it's a party divided into a whole load of very vocal factions. The One, Conser one Nation Conservatives sit in a very different place to the New Conservatives. The ERGers are a different lot to the Common Sense Group, and there are others. And if anyone thought it couldn't get any worse for Rishi Sunak, all of this is about to come to a calamitous head yet again on that vote over the Rwanda policy, a policy that Rishi Sunak seems determined to pursue despite never fully believing in it himself, support, supported by James Cleverley, his Home Secretary, who doesn't really believe in it either, and David Cameron, his Foreign Secretary, also doesn't really believe in it. You begin to see the problem. There are demands for amendments from all of these various Conservatives groups to make Rwanda fit for purpose. Spoiler alert, it'll never succeed. And even if, by a miracle, they found some common ground, the policy will probably never see the light of day. Rishi is pushing, pushing hard on this for no other reason than to try and limit the extent of his downfall at the next election. He's hoping that those hovering Reform Party supporters might just remain loyal. They won't. The raw fact is... Conservative Party don't deserve to win the next election. And whilst the idea of Keir Starmer leading our country is about as welcome as measles, we're going to have to grin and bear it and keep our fingers and toes firmly crossed. So with all of this in mind, who will you be voting for at the next election? 0344 499 1000. Our lines are open. Joining me in the studio, Telegraph columnist and parliamentary sketch writer Madeline Grant is back with us. Madeline, good to see you. Hi. Uh, this was on the front of the Telegraph, of course, your paper. Uh, a, a, a damning poll for Rishi Sunak. And this wasn't just a little tenuous litmus test of public opinion. This was a very thorough, detailed poll. Yeah, exactly. It was actually of a piece with other polling that we've seen so far which have tended to put the Conservatives in the region of yep. 20 points behind on occasion more than that. But when you really start to extrapolate those raw numbers into a seat-by-seat -seat basis, um, it begins to reveal just how damaging it is. And although the threat from Labour is obviously very, very grave and um, the single biggest problem that they face, two other interesting things spring to mind. The Reform Party, which you have mentioned, being potentially the deciding factor in, or at least this is how the Conservative Party will frame it, um, handing these seats mm. to Keir Starmer. But also I think the, 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 the surge of the Lib Dems is interesting. According to this poll, they rise to, I think, just under 50 seats. So it puts them almost at their sort of high watermark under Charles Kennedy yeah, yeah. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the noughties. Uh, so, sort of 59, I think they have. Yeah, them, exactly. They have but you're putting them much closer to that yes, in that absolutely. kind of region. And that's, that's very important too, because there are actually a lot of seats where although people are dissatisfied with the Conservatives, they're not that likely to go. These are not, you know, yeah. left-wing minded people in any in any way, True. shape or form. So the fact that Rishi Sunak has to contend with this pincer movement, and that makes it very, very difficult to combat the discontent in your party because some MPs will be facing a completely different set of complaints on their doorstep True. than others. So how yeah. do you reconcile the two? It's interesting because when, when Johnson got the 80-seat the majority in in 2019, everybody said at the time, it seemed, that, you know, that's not just him there for one term, mm. that's two. Yeah. And the thinking was, you can't overturn an 80-seat majority. Yeah. Part of the thinking was because of Scotland, because for Labour to win, they would need Scotland. Of course, in the intervening years, the SNP have fallen apart, Absolutely. so that opens yeah. the door there. Absolutely. And therefore, this, what seemed insurmountable 80-seat majority, is now very much doable for Labour. Mm. Yeah, and that's why I think perhaps um, in your in your intro um, you were a little too sure that this they're going to Labour would be in power for the next decade. Yeah. The recent years have shown that there's absolutely no sense of party loyalty left anymore, and that when betrayed, voters can very quickly turn on the party that they voted that's for. That's very true. So I don't think it's any party can rest easy on their yeah. comfortable majority. And, and also, and again, I alluded to it at the beginning there. Um, 
you know, this isn't down to you know, Keir Starmer being some incredible political operator. Yeah. He's not Tony Blair. No. You, you could see Blair had that kind of X-factor thing. Starmer doesn't have that. Uh, you know, it all looks good for the first couple of months in office and it's all nice and shiny and yeah. new. Give it a year or so and it all, you know, you begin to hear it creak a bit. Well, what, the, the, the trouble that I have, because I do spend a lot of time watching politicians of all sides of the house giving speeches that I suspect all normal commentators, luckily for them, are not sent to go and watch every speech that Keir Starmer mm. or Rishi Sunak ever do. And the thing that strikes me when I listen to Keir Starmer is that there's very little detail. Many, many people have made this point. There's very little detail um, on the big issues that they, they say that yeah. they will fix. Um, they say, they often talk in very vague platitudes, we will clamp down on the people smugglers and that will solve it as if it were only that simple, yes, etc. just by saying it. They may have more that they are not telling people now because True. right now they can keep vague and wait for the Conservatives to make a mistake. Or it could be that there is a real lack of substance there, yeah. which means that they won't, you know, they will struggle to solve these big problems. Do you sense that, I mean, given that this is, according to the, the, the YouGov Telegraph uh, polling, that this will not only uh, unseat some very famous front benches, well, the back benches, but also some very famous front benches yeah. as well. I mean, there's going to be a lot of casualties in this. Mm. What I still find strange, even going back to the, you know, it's impossible to overturn an 80-seat majority. Yeah. But to this extent, that's the point. Mm. I mean, if it was like, OK, it looks like Starmer could just about nick it. But we're talking about a seismic win. Yeah. The majority of, what was it, 120? Uh, Blair's, I think, was 170. Thatcher's, 83, was about, I think, 140 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but this is convincing stuff. This isn't mm. just nicking it by a whisker. No, no. This no, is it's a not. trouncing. It's, it would be a trouncing. And it's a combination of things, as we've been talking about. It's the perfect storm of everything possible going wrong for the Conservative Party yep. that could go possibly wrong for it. The surge of other parties, a good showing for the Lib Dems, the Re Reform Party, although possibly not even winning a single seat, winning enough votes to... But messing it up. Of course, of course. Yeah, and if yeah. you talk to members of the Reform Party, they often say, I, we have absolutely no... We don't think we're going to win a single seat. They accept the fact that they see their political purpose as to destroy the Conservative Party, to rejuvenate conservatism, so, like, a new party could spring up. But Yes, and that's the thinking, isn't it? But it yeah. kind of... It, it did, because I've thought a lot about that, it did really work kind of for UKIP, if you think about it. Yeah, because you they know, got their referendum. David yeah. Cameron went on to, to do exactly what the UKIP has wanted. Yeah. So they got their, their raison d'etre was, was kind of borne out in the Cameron administration. I wonder whether reform think, well, can not this particular administration, but the next one will be more in, in the, 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 the eye of how we see the world and politics, maybe. Yeah, I mean, maybe. I, I think... However much they dislike the, the Conservatives, way. they're not going to enjoy what, what comes next with no, Labour. Absolutely. I think that will uh, not be to their satisfaction. But, of course, you know, I, I, don't, I think it's quite arrogant for... In a first-past-the-post system, you can get away with that sort of arrogance about yep. your position. Um, but if, I think it's very, it would be a bad look for the Conservatives to basically say, look, your votes belong to us. Yeah, How yeah. dare you give them to someone else, even if we think we've let you down. You know, this, this era of tribal loyalty is, is well and truly dead. I, I think the only way the Conservatives can come back, really, is if they just have somebody who's really very good. You know, yeah. Whether they are a bit to the left of the party or a bit to the right will almost become academic. I think somebody who so just... So do you think that they need a new leader then? Oh, they will certainly need a new leader after Sunak, oh, after okay. the election. Oh, so and you're I... not saying before the... No, no, no. Election. I mean, I don't know. I don't think there's anyone there, to be yeah. honest. It's got... Someone's got to rise from the ashes here or just suddenly appear on the scene that everyone goes, do you know what, that person's really mm. smart. They are really good. So I don't, I'm not sure of all of their politics, but they're just good. It, I, I can't think yeah. of any other way and back. And a good team around them too. And a good as team as well. As we saw with Boris Johnson, you can have yeah, the yeah. charisma to win it, but then well, you, it's actually, funny. you need to actually enact policies in a competent way Absolutely. and have an administration that's not in constant turmoil to and get if, anything done. Yes, yeah, spot on. Yeah. And if ever there was an example of what, the kind of thing that's gone wrong for the Tories, it's this Rwanda bill. We're going to hear more about this yeah. tomorrow when they start to vote. There's amendments and all sorts of things. This sort of division... This predominantly a four-way division in the Tory party, but there are other splinter groups yeah. within the splinter groups. Um, and they're all vying for different... They're, they're completely different. They're almost different parties in some respects. If you yeah. talk the New Conservatives and the One Nationers could be, you know, the difference between Tory and Labour almost. Yeah, well, I mean, I've always thought that the Conservative Party ought to be able to have different people in it. It ought to be... I've, I've felt that it would be a healthier party I if would you agree. could have someone like Tom Tugendhat, who's 
definitely a conservative, maybe to the left of the party, but competent, decent, patriotic, etc. Yep. And someone more on the right of the party. Yep. So I think, you know, within that group, there will be some who are looking to press amendments without kind of torpedoing the whole party. Yeah. But then there are also, um, I'm not saying that's Tom Tugendhat, because I think he's a, he's a minister now, but there will be people in that group that are sort of acting in good faith. But there will be also others who see that perhaps they, I think a lot, some MPs believe that if they're very vocal now, it may help, help them in their, in their particular seat, because their voters will say, well, at least they tried to do something about the Rwanda true. bill, et cetera. Historically, What's happen? that doesn't really work. As no, it's true. But... I mean, 70 Tories, uh, rebels could abstain or back amendments to the Rwanda bill. I mean, this is... Yeah, it's just another nail for Rishi, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I, I, I don't know. I, the thing is, I think that even if the Rwanda bill were to go through, it's not a powerful enough deterrent to make that big of a difference. If a very, very small proportion of the people who do cross the channel and successfully get here, yeah. if the proportion is small enough of those that might end up in Rwanda, I think you probably would say, if you were that desperate or had the money to pay a, tra a people trafficker to take you across, you'd say, well, actually, if my chance of going to Rwanda was like 2% of all the people who crossed the channel or 1%, then I might take my chances with that anyway. So I think this is the Tory mistake, I think, has been to make Rwanda like front and centre of their policy offering on migration and not always be clear from the start that this is just one of many things they're trying to do to bring the numbers down. Yeah. Um, final story to finish on, Madeline. Um, calls to scrap the BBC licence fee. Uh, this was a, an exclusive Talk TV investigation. Today, revealing 130 people every day are prosecuted for failing to pay it. I actually thought, naively, they kind of stopped doing that, Lark. Yeah, I thought yeah. they'd, they'd finished with all of that and gone, you know, we'll collect it if we can. Me but, too. You know, but that's how it seemed. But they're doing... And often in secret courts as well. Oh, it's, it's absolutely awful. There's some of the... I, I, until this, I didn't realise... I knew it happened, but I didn't realise it was happening on so, such a widespread scale. And almost by definition, the people that will get caught up in it will often be those who are very ill, so they're yep. not checking their post or they're in hospital or something. Or there have been some tragic cases I've seen where there have been people with learning disabilities who struggle yeah, yeah. with day-to-day day -day aspects of life, like paying bills and dealing with paperwork and stuff. And or, or maybe people who are less tech literate and able to access it, or perhaps they don't even know that they're... Mm. I mean, I get letters all the time and I don't even have a TV at home, so... Do you not? Yeah, no, no. I. Are you a dodger, Madeline Grant? I don't, have a, I don't have a TV. Is this another talk TV exclusive? I yeah. don't have a TV. Madeline, Madeline <laughs> Grant uh, doesn't have a TV if the licensed people are watching. There's no point in knocking on that door, kids. Um, Madeline is staying with us, because uh, there's a lot to get through. Um, Rishi Surant's going to be addressing Parliament as well this afternoon. He's set to do that. Um, we'll hear more about what has been happening in the Red Sea and the United Kingdom's response to all of that. Uh, join us after the break as we continue right here live on Talk TV. We're here! Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins. Show with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Now, Rishi Sunak is about to address MPs in the Commons for the first time since the UK joined strikes on Houthi targets in Yemen and after a US-owned cargo ship was hit off the coast of the country in the past few hours. The Prime Minister's statement also comes after Defence Secretary Grant Shapps confirmed the government would consider further strikes if the armed rebels did not stop their attacks in the Red Sea. Joining me now... Talk TV's political correspondent Alicia Fitzgerald is, and still with us is the Telegraph columnist and political sketch writer Madeleine Grant. Um, Alicia, this latest news in the last couple of hours, it's another attack. That only means one thing, there will be a response. Definitely. So it was very clear that from the beginning that Rishi Sunak was never going to outright rule out having an another response to this. And this address in the Commons will probably um, elaborate a bit more on that. We can expect him maybe to add some clarification about the decision that was made the first time round and a bit more about what he plans to to do next. It's going to be an interesting statement though because we know that there will be some backlash to it. There's some mm. on the Labour left, the SNP, some Lib Dems, loads of people in the House of Commons who really, really object to any kind of military intervention here. So it's going to be an interesting debate. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that because if ever there was a you know, I, I would have thought you know, the Falklands is arguably, you know, a, a good example of where it would be very hard to argue that this was a case of self-defence and the Falklands was just that another country hops over into somebody else's territory and starts to try to take it over. And similarly with this, I mean, it's, it's demonstrably a self-defence initiative that is going on. I wonder whether there are some part... Well, we kind of know there are the sort of Corbyn, maybe part of the SNP, part of the spe political spectrum, that are ju it's just within their DNA. They The idea that a, the British military would do anything, like even put on a pair of green socks, would upset them. So the idea of firing back is something that's a no-no to them. Maybe, for sure. I think lots of MPs and lots of politicians politicians in general just are quite like anti-violence and anti-military in, yes. in many regards, regardless of the situation. But yep. also here, lots of people see it as us poking the bear with the Middle East. Lots of people see it as we're kind of maybe trying to tempt yeah, them yeah. to actually maybe make our relations a bit worse True. with them. So that's kind of the view um, for those towards the left. Obviously, it's not just really a left-right issue. It's a bit more nuanced than that. There are some people who do seem to cross yeah, over. Yeah. Um, but it's just going to be... It's definitely going to be an interesting debate in the Commons in a bit. Do you sense... I mean, we... The last time when, when this country did respond, along with the United States, you know, we had uh, a, a, a Navy vessel there which was kind of compromised or whatever the correct nautical military term is. Uh, this is an, an, an American, we understand, and it's an American-owned ship that's been hit. Do, does that mean it's only down to the Americans to respond, or would the United Kingdom continue their kind of venture with the US? I suppose... Whether it was one of ours or one of theirs. I think the UK are keen to have some form of allyship with the United States. They're a very powerful yeah. force, especially in the upcoming years. We've got so many conflicts emerging across the country. Mm. And I think the UK will think it's very important to make sure that we really maintain those close ties with other countries. Yeah. 
Um, Madeleine, it's often said, uh, you know, a war is rather useful for, uh, for, for political leaders, and there has been evidence of that in the past. I, I mentioned Thatcher and the Falklands without any doubt clearly assi assisted her back then. Um, interesting, even Iraq, oddly, we forget that Tony Blair won a, you know, a very convincing election after the invasion of Iraq, before all the controversy about WMDs yeah. and, and legacy and whatever. Um, this isn't quite in the same ballpark, um, and I don't imagine that a single person will suddenly vote for Rishi Sunak because he fired off a couple of missiles over there at, at the at the uh, at, 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 uh, the Houthi targets in Yemen. However, um, I'm sure he feels it's a big moment for himself, Mr. Sunak. I mean, these are big decisions. They are. Um, I don't think it's it's in the same ballpark at all because, you know, it's it's it really has a lot to do with international shipping routes and maintaining yeah. those. If you can't safely get ships through the Red Sea, you have to go all the way around Africa. Yeah, yeah. And it's in the sense that it's relevant domestically, I think it would be relevant in the sense that it could massively impact supply chains and people, it's consumers huge. having to pay an awful lot more yeah, yeah. for their everyday products, which at that point you can be damn sure that a lot of people would start to care about um, you know, the um, hostilities in the Middle East. And, and well, you say that, but I heard, I heard a woman yesterday, and, and it was, you know, our sort of anti-war campaign sort of territory, you know, which is, as I always Ooh. seem to say, we're not North Korea, it's fine to have that position, but yeah. she was saying, are we really putting a container above lives, et cetera? And she was really arguing from the, the kind of Gaza standpoint, yeah. which is where the, the yeah. Houthis' loyalties uh, stand, of course. And I thought, well, it isn't just, it's not just a container. I mean, it is about vital supplies. There is a, yeah. a, a, a maritime, I think it's a maritime law that says, you know, you, you, you are about, able to you know, take cargo and and from A to B. Maintaining law and order and, um, and private property, that is kind yeah, of I mean, important. shooting at a ship if, if is you're, just if not a good thing to do, to right? I mean, very weak, it also encourages more, more of the same. Um, it suggests it that, but I think a lot of the debates that we now have about any kind of foreign intervention are just in the shadow of Iraq and Afghanistan, two conflicts that have clearly been an absolute disaster, mm -hmm. looking at the um, return of the Taliban to absolute power yeah. in Afghanistan and um, the rise of Islamic sure. State in Iraq. Yeah. I mean, these couldn't have gone worse. A and I, I do understand why a lot of these discussions, whenever there is any I was the same when we were discussing, wisely in my opinion, the decision not to bomb Syria. It's quite hard to kind of come at this in any way other than through that lens. Yeah, true. Um, and Alicia, you alluded to the fact there will be some MPs that are very much against this. Uh, the one person who definitely won't be against it is Keir Starmer. You can bet your life. He, he, he might have some technical questions, but I'm pretty sure words to the effect of we support the Prime Minister will be... Uh, not far from his lips. Definitely, and he he has said that outright from from the beginning since Rishi Sunak announced this decision. But he's actually come under fire in the past couple of days for this because lots of people are accusing him of backtracking when he was having his leadership campaign in 2020, I think it was, after Jeremy Corbyn um, stood down. He said that he would introduce a vote. He'd make it. He I don't, I don't even know how to word this. He'd introduce a rule in Parliament where you had to have a vote in Parliament before introducing any kind of military yes. action. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now suddenly Rishi Sunak has, has not done that. He's done it without having a democratic vote in Parliament. And Keir Starmer suddenly said, oh, actually, on this instance, that sounds pretty good. We're going to yeah. do that. So he's now been under fire for that. But let's make sure that doesn't detract from the actually important issue here, which is what, what we do um, how, in this situation. How, what is the... I mean, with, you never know with Parliament. I mean, these things can go on for an hour, they can go on for about three hours. Um, we've seen things go on all day, for goodness sake. Um, so this is the Prime Minister making a statement of what happened in the Red Sea, our involvement um, and our military endeavours in response to that. Um, Starmer then makes a speech, and then I assume there are questions from the green benches yes it won't just necessarily just be questions so much i'm sure there will probably be a chance for some mps to actually stand up and speak a little bit yeah. about what their thoughts are on this and, ch and challenge probably likely the status quo and maybe say okay. um on that point we cross to the house of commons the night against houthi military targets in yemen since the 19th of November, Iran-backed Houthis have launched over 25 illegal and unacceptable attacks on commercial shipping in the Red Sea. And on the 9th of January, they mounted a direct attack against British and American warships. They fired on our ships and our sailors. It was the biggest attack on the Royal Navy for decades. And so we acted. We did so in self-defence, consistent with the UN Charter, and to uphold freedom of navigation, 
as Britain has always done. Alongside the United States, with support from Australia, Bahrain, Canada and the Netherlands, we ordered the RAF to strike two Houthi military facilities in Yemen. I want to be clear that these were limited strikes. They were carefully targeted at launch sites for drones and ballistic missiles to to degrade the Houthis' capacity to make further attacks on international shipping. I can tell the House today that our initial assessment is that all 13 planned targets were destroyed. At the drone and cruise missile base in Barney, nine buildings were successfully hit. A further three buildings were hit at Abs Airfield, along with a cruise missile launcher caught in the open. We have seen no evidence thus far of civilian casualties, which we took great care to avoid. I know the whole House will join me in paying tribute to the incredible bravery and professionalism of all our servicemen and women. The need to maximise the security and effectiveness of the operation meant that it was not possible to bring this matter to the House in advance. But we took care to brief members before the strikes took place, including you, of course, Mr Speaker, and the Leader of the Opposition, and I have come to the House at the earliest possible opportunity. Mr Speaker, I do not take decisions on the use of force lightly. That is why I stress that this action was taken in self-defence. It was limited, not escalatory. It was a necessary and proportionate response to a direct threat to UK vessels and therefore to the UK itself. And Mr Speaker, let me be absolutely clear why the Royal Navy is in the Red Sea. They are there as part of Operation Prosperity Guardian, protecting freedom of navigation as a fundamental tenet of international law. The Houthis' attack on international shipping have put innocent lives at risk. They have held one crew hostage for almost two months, and they are causing growing economic disruption. Global commerce cannot operate under such conditions. Containers and tankers are having to take a 5,000-mile detour around the Cape of Good Hope. That pushes up prices and imperils the passage of goods, foods and medicines that the British people and others rely on. We have attempted to resolve this through diplomacy. After numerous international calls for the attacks to stop, a coalition of countries gave the Houthis a clear and unambiguous warning two weeks ago. Last week, the UN Security Council passed a resolution condemning the attacks and highlighting the right of nations to defend their vessels and preserve freedom of navigation. Yet, the Houthis continued on their reckless path. Mr Speaker, we shouldn't fall for their malign narrative that this is about Israel and Gaza. They target ships from around the world. We continue to work towards a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza and to get more aid to civilians. We also continue to support a negotiated settlement in Yemen's civil war. But I want to be very clear that this action is completely unrelated to those issues. It is a direct response to the Houthis' attacks on international shipping. And we should also recognise the risks of inaction. It would weaken international security and the rule of law, further damage freedom of navigation in the global economy, and send a dangerous message that British vessels and British interests are fair game. And there is another point here which is often overlooked. The Houthis' attack risks worsening the dire humanitarian situation in Yemen itself. The UK helps to feed around 100,000 Yemenis every month, with aid arriving via the very sea routes that the Houthis have in their sights. So, Mr Speaker, the threats to shipping must cease. Illegally detained vessels and crews must be released, and we remain prepared to back our words with actions. But, Mr Speaker, dealing with this threat does not detract from our other international commitments. Rather, it strengthens our determination to uphold fundamental UN principles. If our adversaries think that they can distract us from helping Ukraine by threatening international security elsewhere, they could not be more wrong. On Friday, I travelled to Kyiv to meet President Zelensky and address the Ukrainian parliament. I took a message from this House to the RADA that we will stand with Ukraine today, tomorrow and for as long as it takes. If Putin wins in Ukraine, he won't stop there, and other malign actors will be emboldened. 
That's why Ukraine's security is our security. Yeah. That's why the UK will stay the course. And it's why I'm confident that our partners share our resolve. And so far from our resolve faltering, our military support to Ukraine will increase this year. We will provide the single biggest package of defence aid to Ukraine since the war began, worth two and a half billion pounds. This will include more air defence equipment, more anti-tank weapons, more long-range missiles, thousands more rounds of ammunition and artillery shells, training for thousands more Ukrainian servicemen and women, and the single largest package of advanced drones given to Ukraine by any nation. All of this is on top of what we have already provided to support Ukraine. In total, since the war began, the United Kingdom will have provided almost £12 billion of aid to Ukraine. We were the first to train Ukrainian troops first in Europe to provide lethal weapons, first to commit main battle tanks, first to provide long-range missiles, and now we are the first to keep the promise made at the last year's NATO summit, alongside 30 other countries, to provide new bilateral security commitments. Mr Speaker, Ukraine's rightful place is in NATO, and NATO will be stronger with Ukraine in it. But these commitments will help bridge the gap <coughs> until that day comes. Under the new agreement that we signed with President Zelensky, we are building Ukraine's military capabilities, and if Russia ever invades Ukraine again, we will provide swift and sustained assistance, including modern equipment across land, air and sea. Together with our allies, the UK will be there from the first moment until the last. For all of this, Mr Speaker, I bring a message of thanks from President Zelensky to the British people. And today I hope that this House will join me in sending a message back to the Ukrainian people that we stand together as one in support of these firm commitments. Yeah. We are building a new partnership with Ukraine, designed to last 100 years or more. Yes, it's about defence and security, but it's also about trade, investment, culture and more. And there could be no more powerful sign of our unique bond than Ukraine's decision to adopt English as the language of business and diplomacy. And so through the British Council, we're going to fund English language training for the Ukrainian people. Yeah. So, Mr Speaker, in dangerous times, we are investing in defence, hardening our critical infrastructure, building our alliances, and we are resolute in our principles. International security, the rule of law, and freedom to determine your own future. An attack on those principles is an attack on everything that we believe in and on which our lives and livelihoods depend. As the home of parliamentary democracy and a leader in collective security, it is our responsibility to defend those principles and to defend our people. That is who we are. That is what Britain does and will always do. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. We now come to the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Prime Minister for the secure briefing last week and for advanced copy of his statement. Mr Speaker, let me reiterate that Labour backs this targeted action to reinforce maritime security in the Red Sea. We strongly condemn the Houthi attacks that are targeting commercial ships of all nationalities, putting civilians and military personnel in serious danger including British forces. The Houthi attacks are unacceptable, illegal and, if left unaddressed, could lead to a devastating rise in the cost of essential food in some of the poorest countries. And, Mr Speaker, the international community clearly stands against the Houthi attacks. Alongside the UK and the US, four other countries were involved in non-operational support. Over a dozen nations are part of the Maritime Protection Force in the Red Sea, and many others support the recent UN Security Council resolution, which condemns the Houthi attacks in the strongest possible terms. The UK strikes were limited, targeted, and did everything possible to protect civilian lives. That is a proportionate response. Mr Speaker, military action must, of course, always be underpinned by a clear strategy. 
and it is the role of this House to ask the right questions. So I ask the Prime Minister what confidence does he have that his stated objectives have been met? What process will he follow in the face of continued Houthi attacks? What efforts are underway to maintain the support of the international community? And can he confirm that he stands by the parliamentary convention that, where possible, military interventions by the UK government, particularly if they're part of a sustained campaign, should be brought before this House? Yeah. Scrutiny is not the enemy of strategy. Yeah. Because while we back the action taken last week, these strikes still do bring risk. We must avoid escalation across the Middle East. So, can the Prime Minister also tell us how the UK will work with international partners so that our rightful actions are not used as an excuse by those who seek to expand violence throughout the wider region or, indeed, reanimate the conflict in Yemen itself? Nonetheless, Mr Speaker, our armed forces across the region are showing the highest professionalism and bravery both in defending commercial shipping and this targeted action. We thank them. We are proud of them. They continue to show that Britain is a force for good. As does, Mr Speaker, the UK's... And that is the response we are seeing there from uh, Sir Keir Starmer, leader of the opposition, to that statement from the Prime Minister reference uh, with the military, the British and American military response to what happened with the Houthi attacks um, in the Red Sea. Alicia, I mean, pretty kind of fairly standard playbook stuff. I don't say that to undermine anything. I don't know what else a Prime Minister can say. He comes to the House, this is what happened, this was our response, and we stand by it. Pretty, that's it, pretty much. Definitely, and it's just a very rare occurrence where you see Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak actually agree on something in the House yep. of Commons chamber. That very, very rarely happens, and it's probably quite nice for people to watch um, for a change. I think what was interesting there was Keir Starmer's questions. He actually just asked what we were just talking about, the idea of putting it to a vote in Parliament in the House of Commons. Obviously, Rishi Sunak opened his speech by saying there simply wasn't time, it was an emergency, and actually, by announcing it in the House of Commons, he could have jeopardised the military action. But there you can see that Keir Starmer has maybe listened to some people in his party who queried that and has asked yeah. for the Prime Minister's response. Yeah, I, I sense that will be... Is it enough, Madeline, for those people on the back benches, of the Labour back benches, and some Lib Dems and SNP characters to go, oh, right, yeah, Starmer's talking our language here. He's, there's a reservation about this. They're not quite so reserved about Israel and Gaza, interestingly. I don't, I don't think, suppose it will make much of a difference to their view of, 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 of events. But, you know, does it really matter to Keir Starmer? Yeah. Um, it's likely that in a few months' time he'll have a big enough majority that he doesn't even have to listen to the Richard Bergens and Zara Sultanas of this world. So, um, you know, I... He hasn't got to listen to anyone with 120 majority, <laughs> if that is true. But, but I, I, that, I, I think, actually, part of... Starmer's um, rebuilding trust in Labour and restoring confidence in the brand was to essentially ostracise that wing of the party, sometimes yeah. to the point of it be becoming quite a sort of a much less democratic party than it had been in the past, where it did sort of members had a greater say. Um, it's now so centrally planned, so managerial. Yeah. And if anything, I almost think that when they get a pushback from that unelectable left wing of the Labour Party, they may even celebrate it because it shows that there is such yeah, such yeah. a level of clean blue water between them and um, the well, Corbyn East. Uh, it, was, it was there under Blair, wasn't it? Very tight management. And, yeah. and then it sort of re that returned back to, you know, the every single man, woman and their dog had a say on everything and a yeah. vote. And, you know, your canary only had to tweet to register their disquiet to a policy, etc. Yeah. Um, and now it's gone back to the, the, the kind of good old so days of... It's, uh, it's, it's gone actually even more centrally planned and managerial than it was under, under Blair. Correct, absolutely. Um, Madeline, listen, we're out of time. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in. Madeline Grant from The Telegraph with us here on the programme. Alicia is still with us as well. Coming up after the break, we change gear. Gary Lineker sparks yet another impartiality round as the BBC presenter backs calls to remove Israel from all global football tournaments. I'm Ian Collins and you're with Talk TV on TV, radio, online and your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. 
criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm off calm. Just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing interviews. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational discussion You can't, discussion can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. And welcome back to the show. I'm Ian Collins, and you're with Talk on TV, radio, online, and of course, on your smart speaker. Now, the BBC is facing pressure to discipline Gary Lineker after he backed calls via a retweet for Israel to be banned from international football. The Match of the Day presenter has been labelled ill-informed and ignorant after he reposted a call for Israel to be sanctioned by FIFA and the International Olympic Committee. Now, this is a curious one, of course, because we've all retweeted something and not necessarily supposedly meant to be a reflection of our own opinions. In fact, how many people on social media expressly say, look, a retweet or a like is not necessarily a representation of my views? So you kind of have the get-out-of-jail card in that respect. However... We're talking about Gary Lineker here, and we're talking about the BBC. Joining us now, ex-president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews, Jonathan Arkash. Jonathan, good afternoon to you. Hello, good afternoon. Nice to have you with us. Um, I mean, it's sort of the perfect cocktail of doom, really, isn't it? It's Gary Lineker again, it's the BBC again, and it's Twitter again. Well, Gary Lineker's got quite a lot of form here. I'm sure he knows about football, but I wish he would stop uh, making his wise statements about the Middle East. But what gets me is that um, he only has Israel as his target. And the problem with the Fiji is that they only ever talk about Israel. Uh, we're just, you know, between Russia and Ukraine at the moment. Yeah. 
with hundreds of thousands of dead people after Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia also plays football internationally. Yep. As far as I know, Gary Lineker hasn't said a word about it. As someone who targets just one country, Israel, you wonder why. And you then wonder why it doesn't say a word about anti-Semitism or the attacks of October the 7th, which led to the war. I, I think you are you are spot on as ever, Jonathan, on this. Uh, just to extend that uh, interesting list of, of what isn't there, um, Saudi Arabia isn't really mentioned. Qatar, of course, the previous host of the World Cup, um, isn't there either. It is... I will forever scratch my head on why any... anyone who I assume to have a sense or a semblance of intelligence... I, Mr Lineker might be a lot of things, but I would imagine he's... You know, he's usually switched on in some respect. Why somebody would wish to align themselves with a medieval death cult as distinct from a progressive first world ally of ours, I will forever find a mystery. But there's plenty of others quite like him out there, it seems. I don't know what motivates them. He might argue, Jonathan, he might say, look, all I did was retweet this. Um, therefore, I'm just putting it up for discussion. I'm not necessarily endorsing it. I mean, I think it's a weak defence, because it is Lineker we're talking about, but that may well be his only defence. I don't think that's his defence. He doesn't put it that way. His tweet, first he deleted it, then he restored it, was quite unambiguous. Israel should be barred from all international competitions. Not, should we discuss whether Israel should be barred? So unequivocal stuff in that respect. No, no, uh, no grey areas. Um, it of course calls into question the BBC, uh, who've already been called into question multiple times, certainly over the, uh, how they originally covered, um, frankly, outrageously covered the uh, October the seventh massacre, um, and subsequently still haven't really covered themselves in glory. And and this is perhaps you know just by. By dint of the fact this is one of their people, might not be an employee, but he's one of theirs, this doesn't make it uh, any, any better for an already brutally damaged BBC, Jonathan. And I, I think we might have lost Jonathan on that point. Um, I, I, listen, Jonathan, thank you for being with us. Unfortunately, your line got the better of us right at the very end of the programme, nonetheless. Um, I wonder whether, and I think most people's best guess... Uh, that, by the way, was Jonathan O'Kesh, ex-president of the Board of Deputies of British Jews. I do wonder, and I'm, I'm not the first person to theorise on this, and I think last time we spoke, Lineker, uh, we, we raised the same point. Is this a, a fellow that's just demob happy? He doesn't really give a toss anymore, does he? You know, he's Gary Lineker, he's a millionaire, his football career has been done, he's done the TV thing... He's probably fed up with the BBC. He's going to go out with a blast and he wants to die, metaphorically speaking, as somewhat of a martyr. And he's going in the right direction. That's the end of the show. Thanks for watching. Vanessa's next. See you tomorrow. We're here. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals to using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about sport today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi Sunak the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. 
Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. <laughs>